morning, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us today and tuning in. Wherever you are this morning, would you just join us now as we sing out these songs of praise. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this place, Jesus. We are here for you this morning, Lord, to meet with you, to offer up the songs of worship and praise to you, to hear from you, God. So would you be welcome in this place? Would you be blessed by our praise as we sing out to the one who is worthy? We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep. rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. As your love is devoted, like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, as faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me. 
And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be.
Lord, this morning we sing of your greatness, Lord. We sing of all that you are, all that you have done for us. Lord, that you were able to come and offer yourself a perfect, spotless sacrifice, Lord, that not even death in the grave could hold. But you won the victory for us that day, Jesus. And because of who you are, Lord, you deserve all honor and all glory. All praise unto you and you alone. For you surely and truly are great and greater than anything else, Lord. 
that you are the name above all names, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, that you are worthy and deserving of our praise this day, Jesus. That nothing can stand in comparison to you, Lord. Nothing can stand against you, God. But you are all power. You are all might. You are all worthy, Jesus. And so we lift up our voices in praise to you this day, God. Lord, we lift up our voices in honor of who you are and what you've done. We lift up our voices to glorify you as King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh God, would you be blessed by our praise this morning? Would you be honored by our worship? Lord, this all small smack sacrifice that we give to you today, Jesus. Oh God, that it would be pleasing to you, Lord. We are grateful. We are thankful. We stand in awe of who you are, God. All that we are and all that we have, Jesus, we owe to you. So we thank you, we love you, and we bless your name today, Lord. Thank you for meeting us here. We give you our praise, Jesus, for you are worthy. You are so worthy of our praise, Lord. We bless your name. Amen. Hey, again, I'd like to just say a very special welcome to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thanks for uh, just praising God together and just uh, experiencing the presence of God. I hope you uh, really felt the Lord's presence in our time of worship as we shared this morning together. And now as we go into the Word here in this beautiful month of March, it's wonderful. You know, uh, as I woke up uh, the last few days, I've noticed that uh, the sun is getting up earlier every day and the days are staying longer. It's nice to see a lot of melting happening with the snow. I know up at our house, there's still been a lot of snow through this week, uh, still on the yard, but a lot of it's melting. So thank God for the change in seasons that we're having and thank God for the beautiful uh, weather uh, that we're able to experience. And so praise God for that. So this morning, I'd like to uh, begin on a short series. It's just a two-part series, this, this week and next week, um, on uh, the God who sees, the God who sees. And uh, sort of jumping off of where we left off last week as we, uh, we looked at how God revealed himself progressively through the generations. Uh, but let's take a look at this and see this God who sees uh, to see how he's revealed himself as well through the generations leading up to where we are today. Uh, and so we're going to go and, and look at the story first of Hagar. And I preached about her just a few months ago. Um, but in this story, it's an incredible story of, of this woman. And just like in last, last week's sermon, we saw that God deals not just with, quote, his people, but with all people. All people are his people. Um, not all people are redeemed, but God loves all people. And so in the Bible, he deals specifically with the children of Israel to some, you know, to some major degree. But there's also all these other people that God has dealt with. Uh, of course, people like Abraham, who was not a Jew, uh, neither was Isaac, neither was, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Jacob is the children of Israel, our descendants of Jacob. Uh, Job, we talked about last week, and Melchizedek, and of course, Adam and Eve and Seth, these were not people who were uh, uh, the children of Israel, they were not Hebrews. And so, um, at the same time, here in this story, we look at Hagar, uh, who is not, uh, she's not a, a Hebrew, um, and in fact, she is the slave girl of Sarah, uh, the wife of Abraham. And uh, we picked the story up here with her where she is really in a, in a very bad place. And, and she's been put into a, uh, a circumstance that she really didn't ask for on her own. Um, but uh, how many of you know, sometimes we find ourselves in those circumstances uh, that are not there necessarily because of anything we've done, uh, but somehow the situation of life sort of works out in such a way 
that we find ourselves in a very difficult spot. And so we're going to see this with Hagar here today as we go into Genesis uh, chapter 16, as we look at Hagar's story and we look at her and El Roy, the God who sees. Uh, verse 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And so uh, let me just stop and say, that, that's just a terrible idea. You know, it's, it's not a good idea. Um, and you can just see it right from the start. You almost want to shout, no, 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 don't do this. Um, but this is what took place in this dysfunctional family here of Abram and Sarai. <clears throat> um, and so uh, what does it say? It says, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai took it, took Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to his husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard all of your misery. He will be a wide donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave, him, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So in this, this incredible story here, you know, this, this really, uh, this is a very old story, and yet it really sort of um, brings us into right where we're at in 2020 and 2021. You know, there's been so much talk of injustice through this past year, and here we see incredible injustice happening. Uh, you know, and, and, and listen, as long as there's a human experience, there's going to be injustice. Um, and the reality is that what Hagar discovered is that as she goes through this, God appears to her and she calls him El Roy or the God who sees. And know this. Listen, the message that we have a church, as a church is this. No matter what injustice you're going through, God sees it. And, and injustice comes to us you know, in, in many ways in our lives. The world is full of injustice. And the reality is God sees the injustice that's done. Uh, and he's there as the God who sees. And he doesn't just see, but he also provides through that time. Um, you know, we see here that um, God is having direct involvement with this woman, Hagar. It's interesting, you know, when you go and you look at, at, at what she's going through. Have you ever been in a place where you feel sort of like her? Have you ever been in a place, perhaps, where you can feel like you can relate to her? You know, the fear, the lonesomeness of where she was at. The idea that everything that she had worked for is now coming to an end. Perhaps even the idea that, you know, uh, she didn't know what her safety would be like, you know, because she was now carrying the child of, uh, of her master, you know, and uh, what would the outcome of this be for her? She thought, perhaps, does anyone care about me? Does anyone know what I'm going through? You know, sometimes we find ourselves in a place like that where we wonder, does anybody really care? Does anybody know what we're going through? And, uh, you know, we, we uh, are, are blessed today in knowing that we have a God who is with us, a friend who sticks closer than a brother to us through Jesus Christ, right? Um, John Donne, in his devotions in 1624, wrote this, and he said, No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And it seems so often that we don't see the reality of that, and we find ourselves much like islands in the sea, where we are no longer part of anything. Sometimes we feel removed, 
And boy, you know, through COVID, boy, has that really came to the surface in so many lives. I mean, if you look at the people who really feel disconnected, loved ones who have not been able to be together, I can't imagine having a loved one who was sick and you couldn't go to visit them. You know, maybe they were dying. I mean, how many, how many times through COVID have people had to deal with deaths of loved ones that they could no longer even go and say goodbye to? What a terrible thing has taken place in our society over this past year. You know, and as we're coming up on that <clears throat> anniversary of the beginning of these, these shutdowns, you know, where we come up on this anniversary of, of what we were, were calling back then two weeks to flatten the curve, and that was a year ago. And so, you know, we've all been through this questioning time through this past year. And so there's a number of things we can look at from this story. And number one is that we can know that God sees us. You know, we're never, we're, we're never invisible to him. There's never a time when we are out of the sight of God. You can't hide from him. And nor can anything get in between you and God and remove his eyes from watching you. You know, God is always looking over us. He's always watching us. He's always there. He is the God who sees. There's no question about it. Jesus came along in his ministry and he said to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. I mean, think about that. The flowers out that are growing outside, the plants. They don't worry about what they're going to do. And, you know, it, it won't be long and in our yards and around our houses and we'll be able to drive and see, you know, flowers that will be popping up through the ground. Crocuses, as soon as the snow melts, uh, this month, crocuses are going to start popping up. And then e eventually daffodils and hyacinths and tulips and those spring bulbs will begin to come up. You know, this is a time of year right now out in the country where they're tapping maple trees because of the, of the you know, the freeze thaw, uh, you know, uh, that's happening continually. Uh, you know, you're, they're starting to get maple syrup now from those trees. And so this is a time when, when we can see life happening. And, and you don't see these things worrying about this. God has provided for them. And if God provides for them, why would he also not provide for you? We know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that he knew us even before we were formed in our mother's womb. The prophet Jeremiah shares that with us. The Lord spoke to him that truth. And then we can also know that we were purchased by God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his son. Not only does he love us like he loves the, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, but, but he loves us in such a way that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. You know, he loves the earth, but he sent Jesus to die for people. He didn't send Jesus to die for trees or for rocks, but he did send Jesus to die for people. And so know that God loves you in such a way that he's willing to provide, even through his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us so that we can no longer be slaves to sin, but heirs of God and joint heirs through Jesus Christ, his children today, amen? In Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, this great verse tells us, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, so we are the handiwork of God. We're not just, you know, we're not just, accidents that took place down here, but God has a reason for being for us and has created us to do good things for him. This is how much you're known by God. And not only that, not only does he just know us, but he also knows our name. You know, you ever get, you know, you ever meet somebody and you haven't seen them in a few years, you can't remember their name, you know, or maybe somebody doesn't remember your name. You meet an old teacher you used to have and you're like, oh, yeah, I think I remember you. What was your name? You know, God knows your name. It's so incredible. He knows us. He knows us right where we live. He knows us down deep, better than we know ourselves, perhaps. Uh, one of the things that's really powerful about this passage is, you know, you see how Abram and Sarai were talking about Hagar and and Hagar's like, hey, I have a slave. Um, I'm going give, to give her to you to sleep with so maybe I can have a child with my slave. She refers to Hagar as my slave. Abram, when he's talking about her, I mean, Abram slept with this woman and, 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 and made her pregnant. And what does he say? He refers to her as, do what you want with your slave. I mean, this woman has no dignity, you know, as she's, as she's referred to by Abram and Sarai. But when the Lord sees her, the Lord calls her by name, Hagar. He calls her Hagar. He lets her know that, listen, he sees what's going on in her life, and he knows who she is. It doesn't say that she was an active worshiper of, of Yahweh. It doesn't say that she knew the Lord. Um, 
but it does say that God knew her. And how many, think of that, how many people outside the fold of the kingdom of God uh, you know, feel like they don't know if anybody's watching them. God watches them all. He's looking at all people. You know, from the highest to the lowest, from the greatest to the least, from the person that is the most excellent of character to the person who's the worst. God sees them and knows them by name. This is an incredible thing. When God found Hagar at the well, his first word out of his mouth was her name, Hagar. He called her by name. Uh, God is always willing to show decency to people, you know, um, and let's remember that as we deal with people. You know, there are people sometimes that you feel you're better than, or maybe you feel that are better than you, and know that God knows us all. And we should show decency to those around us as well, to those who we think we are better than, and as well, we should show decency to those that we think, think they're better than we are. Um, you know, and, and, and show that love of God that we have, that God has given into us, through all to the people that we have contact with. In this story, Hagar, out of gratitude, um, gives God a name. This is one of the few places in Scripture where somebody gives God a name. I mean, think about that. You know, here's this woman. She was an Egyptian, <laughs> a slave girl, uh, you know, a slave girl who, you know, she has sexual relations with her master, uh, you know, and, and yet... She gives God a name. Think about that. So Hagar, in her gratitude to God, gives God a name, El Roy, or the God who sees. We read that in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13. She's one of the few people in the Bible that actually gives God a name. I mean, how interesting is that? We can understand a couple of things from this. Number one is that, that God sees our situation. He sees where we're at right now. He sees what we're going through. He sees what's happening in our life. He sees what's happening at work. He sees what's happening at school. He sees what's happening at home. He sees your situation. He sees what is going on in your life, all right? Um, uh, the author, Stephen uh, Altraj, he writes and he says, Jesus knows us fully. He knows every nook and cranny of us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Isn't that the truth? Amen. And then secondly, we would also see that God sees our need. Um, he, he sees the need that we have as well in our life, the need that's there on a daily basis. He came and he found Hagar as she was wandering, and he sought her out and found her at her point of greatest need. And it's interesting, um, a little more than a decade later, God again finds Hagar wandering and appears to her. You know, and I have to wonder all the things that took place between that first and second uh, opportunity to meet God, um, how much this meant to Hagar as she understood that God saw her situation, he saw her need that she was in. And God meets us in our place of physical need as well, emotional need, spiritual need, psychological need, whatever the case may be, God meets us in those places of need. In 1 Peter chapter 5, the apostle Peter writes about this in verse 7 of, of the fifth chapter of his first epistle. And he says, cast all your anxiety on him. Cast all your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. See, we understand the fact that God cares for us because we can see it through Jesus Christ. We can cast our cares on him, even our anxieties on him. That's a good reminder for you today. What are those things that are bringing anxiety in your life? What are those things that are making you anxious? These are good things to be able to cast upon Jesus, to give them to him because he cares for us, amen? And secondly, this morning, we're gonna look not just at Hagar, but at another non-Hebrew woman in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, and that's the character of Ruth. Now, I actually did a sermon series on Ruth back maybe five years ago or so, and it was really an interesting series to do, to sort of look at the book of Ruth and go through it step by step. And what incredible stories it tells as well, as we look at this idea of God seeing us and seeing right where we're at in our point of need. Um, as we look at this character, Ruth, we're, uh, we're taking on a short journey here where this family that's living in Israel during a time of famine decides to go from Israel to a neighboring, uh, neighboring nation, uh, a nation that was related to Israel, 
uh, to the nation of Moab. And so if you go back and you look at the history of who uh, these nations are that are right next to Israel, there's three that are right next to them from north to south. Uh, you have the, the, uh, Ammonite, uh, the uh, Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites. All right? And so the Ammonites were to just to the north and east of Israel, and they were descended from Lot um, through the incestuous child that was birthed between Lot and his youngest daughter. Um, and so uh, this child that was birthed from Lot and his younger daughter became the father of what was known as the Ammonites. And then in the middle to the east of Israel was the Moabites. And they were the descendants uh, of Lot and his oldest daughter, the incestuous child that was given in birth uh, between Lot and his oldest child, his oldest daughter. And uh, that child became the father of the uh, Moabites. And so they were related to the children of Israel, but they were not Israelites. And then, of course, directly below them, uh, to the south and east of Israel, uh, were the Edomites. And they were the descendants of uh, Jacob's twin brother, uh, fraternal twin brother, Esau. Uh, and so they were related to the Israelites, but they were not Israelites. And so uh, it, it was common to spend some time for the Israelites to travel into those nations because they were related um, and so this, this family goes to Moab uh, to sort of weather the storm through the, uh, through the famine that was there in Israel. And as they're there, um, Elimelech and his wife Naomi, uh, they had their two sons, Malon and Kilion. Uh, those two sons found Moabite wives and married Moabite women while they were there. And then, of course, those two sons, along with Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And so what a tragic story. What a terrible story. I mean, this is the kind of story that the media would just trumpet because the media always tries to find like the worst story to possibly find and to make that, you know, the focus of themselves. And so, you know, this family's story would be great, uh, you know, because it's just so utterly tragic. I mean, it really is. And so there's these three women, these three widowed women that are sort of living together in the same house. And Naomi finally comes to the place where she realizes, I don't belong here. I need to go back to my people. I need to go back to Israel, to Bethlehem, where I'm from. And so she gets her two daughter-in-laws with her, and she says to them, hey, you know, listen, I'm going to go back to, it, to my people in Israel. You're young enough. You need to go to your father's houses and, and find, you know, find another man to, to be married to. You're young enough. They had no children at this point, you know. And so um, uh, Ruth and um, Orpah, uh, are the two women that are there living with Naomi, uh, her daughter-in-laws. And of course, Orpah decides to go back to her family. But Ruth has a different idea. And we look at this story here where, where Ruth is connected to Naomi in such a way. And it's not just this idea that she, she wants to stay with Naomi because she finds security in Naomi. There's something deeper than this. Uh, in this, of course, if you haven't read the book of Ruth, it's a very easy read. It's only four chapters long. It makes great reading, and I'd encourage you to read it. But as we do, we, we, we have to come to terms with a few of the things from this book as we look at how Ruth responded to the God who sees. Now think about this. In the story, Naomi is the Hebrew. She's the Jewish woman. She's been raised... Uh, you know, understanding the Jewish scriptures. She's been raised knowing who God was, uh, as this Yahweh, this, this God who's personal God to the Israelites. She knew this personal God. Ruth, on the other hand, was raised as a Moabite. And the Moabites didn't worship Yahweh. They didn't worship the Lord. They worshiped the God called uh, 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 Kemoth, or, or, or it looks like... Chemosh, but it's, it's actually Kemoth, all right? And so Ruth um, uh, doesn't know Jehovah. She doesn't know Yahweh. She doesn't know Yahweh. But she decides to go with Naomi. She sees something about Naomi and about this connection that she has to the Almighty God that puts something real in Ruth's heart. And in, in Ruth chapter 1, we see this here um, as we look at really Ruth's first redemption. Uh, and this first redemption was a repentance and a conversion really on Ruth's part from being a Moabite 
to now saying, listen, I'm, I'm going to follow Yahweh, not come off, not my old gods, not my family's gods. I want to follow the true God. And it's interesting here in verse 16, it says this, but Ruth replied as she's talking to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. See, this is an incredible thing. Ruth says here, and we talked about this a little bit last week, we talked about how God appeared to those different peoples as, you know, his name represented something different. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was El Shaddai, you know, the overpowering God. And yet to Moses and the children of Israel, he appears as Yahweh. So that there is this personal nature. Uh, To, uh, uh, you know, earlier in our story today, as we looked at Hagar, Hagar saw the Lord as El Roy, the God who sees. And now we see that Ruth, as she's referring to the Lord, refers to the Lord here and, and, and calling him the Lord and saying, hey, listen, where you go, I will go. She refers to the Lord as Elohim, Elohim. She's talking about the God of the Israelites. She's seeking after him now. She's basically saying, hey, listen, no longer am I going to be falling after, after Kemoth, after Shemosh, or however you pronounce it, however you want to pronounce it, it's pronounced Kemoth, I'm no longer following after him, this God of the Moabites. Now I choose to follow the God of Israel, this personal God of the Israelites. I'm no longer going to be that person. I'm I'm willing to leave Moab, the place of Kemoth, to travel and relocate to Israel. And I will go with you, Naomi, to the house of bread, Bethlehem. I will go there. I will leave my people And your people will be my people. I will dwell in that house of bread. I will be fed by what you're fed by. And so we see this change in in Ruth. And it's really a redemption that takes place. It's the first redemption that Ruth receives. And it's a a redemption of repentance and confession. And uh, she's able to go and, um, and be converted to follow Christ, to follow God. Uh, We see here that Ruth is willing to work as well. When they arrived there in Bethlehem, um, Ruth and Naomi, of course, it causes quite a stir. And so as they come back, Naomi is really, she's sort of like a drama queen, okay? I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but like Naomi is, is uh, you know, the women from the community, hey, Naomi is back, and, and she has her Moabite daughter-in-law with her, you know, and they all heard that her husband died and her sons died, and it's all this tragic thing. It's like a lifetime movie, you know, that, that her life has been. And so, you know, they all come to see her. And Naomi is just like, she's like crying the blues. You know, dun, 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 You know what I'm saying? She's just, she's just singing the blues. But Ruth has a different approach. Ruth has a different approach. And we see it here in, in verse uh, 19 of chapter 1. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? And so what does Naomi say? Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And so the name Mara uh, that she's referring to, it was sort of like a, a bitterness. It was, there was a bitterness in her mouth. And so Naomi here, uh, she returns back home and she begins to blame God for the misfortune that took place in her life. She's playing the blame game there. You know, and how often do we play the blame game in our lives? How often do we, you know, do we place blame when bad things happen in our lives? And, and we... The worst of it is we blame God for those things that happen bad in our lives. You get sick, you blame God because of it. Somebody does something wrong to you, you blame God because of it. You know, and I hear this all the time. And listen, this is, this is human nature. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not condemning us for doing this because 
We all do it. Something bad happens, ultimately God gets the blame for it. You know, we do something good, we take the credit for it. But when something bad happens, we're always willing to blame God about it. And I don't know about you, but I've done that in my life. I'm sure you've done it in your life as well. And Naomi, really, she, she's, she's world class at this. She's a professional. She makes a big sob story about, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. My life is bitter because what God has done to me. And it's so unfair to blame God for the bad. God does so much good in our lives. And yet, this is where we find ourselves so often is just blaming him when things go wrong, you know? Who are you blaming in your life? Are you playing the blame game, you know? It's a great question to have. Um, Ruth, on the other hand, shows a willingness to work. She goes out. Naomi is sort of crying the blues, and she's entertaining the ladies and telling them how bad things are. Ruth gets to work. I mean, she's in a new place. You know, she's living in a new place, in a new nation. She's, you know, she could very easily have just, you know, just sort of stayed over in the corner on her own, but she's willing to get up and get to work. And listen, so many times what we need to do when we find ourselves in a funk in our lives is not to remain in that funk and not to commiserate in that funk, not to share that funk on social media and find people to commiserate with you and make you feel better. It doesn't make you feel better. You just make other people feel worse. And, and listen, making other people feel worse does not make us feel better. And so Ruth comes along and Ruth decides, hey, listen, I'm not going to be stuck in this funk. I'm going to go out and I'm going to work. It's a time of harvest. And so she goes out and um, not only does she find, uh, you know, enough grain to harvest for herself and her, her mother-in-law, but she runs into, dun da da guess what? A handsome guy, you know? And this handsome guy just happens to be the guy that owns the fields that she's, she's gleaning in, you know? And so, you know, sometimes instead of blaming God, if we just got busy and just did something and moved forward and, and, and tried to do something positive and made the best out of a bad situation in our lives, sometimes God gives us an incredible blessing in that time of what we think is cursing. As we go forward and just are willing to work, and Ruth was willing to work, and she goes into the fields, and God orchestrates a series of events that would change her life, and really that would, that would even change our lives, even till today, all right? And so we see here that Ruth is not just willing to, to go, willing to work, but she's also willing to listen. She listens to, to Naomi. Even, and, and listen, sometimes, sometimes you gotta take advice from people who are in the midst of a funk themselves. Maybe because they're older and they've been through it, you know? And so uh, she finds this guy and there's this attraction between her and Boaz, and Ruth doesn't know what to do. She's a foreigner. She doesn't know what to do. And Naomi gives her specific instructions to do. And it's amazing. As you read through it, I'd encourage you to read through it. It's really an incredible story. I mean, you know, some of the stuff that happens, the, the pictures of what took place is not normal in our, in our t day and age. But it's really an incredible story. And so she listens to her mother-in-law. And she goes through it step by step. And she's submissive to her. She's submissive to Boaz. And God does an incredible thing in her life. Um, in fact, Boaz, when he, he finally marries Ruth, um, he calls her a woman of excellence, a woman of excellence, and accepts her as his wife. Um, the book of Ruth begins with catastrophic death, and it ends with triumphant life. Not only does Ruth go on to marry Boaz, but she has uh, a son, Obed, who has a son, uh, as well, who, uh, who finally becomes the father of Jesse. And then Jesse, of course, is the father of none other than the infamous and the famous King David. And so because of Ruth's obedience to God and Ruth's willingness to look and see the God who sees and that, that God who sees is going to make a difference in her life, uh, King David becomes into the picture uh, as one of her descendants. It's an amazing, amazing thing. In that story, we see of Ruth's humility. It talks about Ruth's humility. It talks about her comeliness. In other words, she was an attractive woman. And let me just say this, you don't have to be a model to be attractive. You just have to, you know, you just have to take care of yourself and believe in yourself, you know? And uh, all people are beautiful, you know? All men, all women are beautiful. 
You've got to realize you're beautiful sometimes, ladies, you know? And, uh, you know, maybe you're not like one of those, uh, you know, vapid Hollywood people uh, that, you know, have everything on the outside and nothing on the inside. Listen, beauty is all through. And sometimes we have to realize God has made us beautiful. It says he makes all things beautiful in their time. And there's a time when God makes us beautiful, you know? And so, um, and there's so much, you know, I don't want to get off track on this here this morning, but there's so much emphasis placed on outer beauty and we forget. It's not just outer. Outer beauty is important too, you know? But it's, it's what's on the inside that counts as well. And, uh, and, and, and we need to just take care of what God has given us as men and as women, you know, and, and, and maybe you don't look, maybe you're a man and, you know, you don't look like, you know, um, you know, some great, you know, actor or whatever. You're not handsome. Like, so you are who you are, you know, understand who you are, take good care of yourself and, um, and, and, and believe as, as it says about, you know, uh, Ruth, Ruth was humble. She had comeliness. She was also a woman of industry and she was a woman of great morality. And so those are four great principles for us to sort of follow after in our own lives as well. You know, maybe we're willing to work, maybe we're willing to take care of what God has given us. May we be uh, willing to serve uh, in hum humility. And then, of course, uh, may, we, may we be people of character and integrity in these dark days as well. And so as we look at that, uh, a question I'd like to leave with you this morning as we look at this idea of a God who sees. Ruth was willing to give up everything for that God who sees. Hagar, Hagar uh, was at a, 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 a terrible place in her life and she realized that God was a God who sees. So um, and when you look at Ruth in her life, she had a husband who was taken away because of death. Um, but she was able to go on and God restored to her. You know, and so my question for you is in the God who sees in your life, and Ruth is a picture of this. It's a picture of being married to, to God. Are you, do you find yourself married to God? Are you married to him or, or are you just sort of dating him? Maybe it's speed dating you're doing with God, you know? Are you married to Christ? Have you pledged yourself to him completely? Or are you just sort of dating him and seeing him nonchalantly, you know? What's the level of your commitment to him today? Know that he's the God who sees you. And he's fully committed to you. What's your level of commitment to him? You know, are you more like Ruth? Or are you more like uh, that other daughter-in-law, Orpah? You know, as, as she went back to her own people, to her own God, uh, you know, the God of the uh, Moabites, Ruth left what was there behind and followed after what was to come. And that was the God of Israel. Who are you following today? You know? Uh, let me pray for you this morning as we transition out of here, as we look at this God who sees. Know that God sees you right where you're at and God is providing for you. He has a plan for your life and a purpose with a hope and a future of the days to come. Maybe you're concerned about some of the things that are happening in this world and the things that will be happening in the days to come. Know that God is in control and know that God has a plan for you as well. He is the God who sees and he knows you by name, amen? Jesus, I thank you that you are faithful to us. I thank you, Lord, that you are not just a God who's up in heaven, who occasionally looks down upon us, but Jesus, you dwell right with us. You live in us through the Holy Spirit. And so what befalls us befalls you. And so we come to you this day and we ask for your uh, hand to be extended towards us that we might respond much as Hagar did. And she went back and she listened to what the Lord instructed her. And she went back and she lived in submission to Sarai and to Abram. And from that, Lord, you have created great nations. Lord, help us to be like Ruth and to not allow the things that have happened negatively in our lives to affect what you desire to do in the days to come. But Lord, help us to return to you, to be redeemed by you so that, Lord, we can be used in greater ways in the days to come. And bless these people, Lord. Bless your congregation this day. Lord, bless each one at home right now as they're watching this. Lord, bless, Lord, each one perhaps as they're maybe in their car listening to this. Whatever the case may be, Lord, bless each one of us and help us to be faithful to follow after you, 
to pledge ourselves to you. Lord, we don't want to just date you. We want to be pledged to you, to marry you, Lord, to commit ourselves to you because, Lord, we know you've committed yourself to us and you see us and you hear our cries and you deliver in our lives. Bless your ones this week, O oh God, and grant them a great blessing and make them a blessing in the lives of those around them as well. Lord, may your glory fall upon us and rest upon us this day. And we thank you and praise you for all these things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Lord, bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week. And uh, may the God who sees be ever real in your life. Amen.